this is what we call a packed room. Uh, no wonder, uh, we have a great panel, but we also have, uh, I think, uh, one of the most topical issues on the agenda. Uh, how is uh, the geopolitics of the world doing? Uh, someone asked me that last night, and I said it's, uh, it's, uh, it's worse than last year, but uh, I'm not sure if it's, uh, if it's uh, better than next year. Let's see, after we have had um, the panel. Uh, I, I think, seriously, uh, this annual meeting in Davos is happening against one of the most complicated geopolitical and geoeconomic landscapes or backdrops we've seen for decades. This session is about also identifying the opportunities that are for cooperation even in a fractured world. And we saw, for example, during the Bali meeting, G20, that President Biden and uh, um, also President Xi Jinping came together. They restarted um, the process on climate uh, after listening to uh, Vice Premier Li He earlier today. I think there's also hope uh, for new processes. So um, we are currently um, in a situation where also Kristalina Gergeva, head of IMF, has said that uh, there might be a recession in one third um, of the world. And if we don't get the geopolitics right, I think they're more difficult to also have a recovery. To discuss this, we're, we have, uh, as I mentioned, Kristalina Gergeva, head of uh, IMF, managing director. We um, have Mohammed uh, Abin. Uh, we have Mohammed Al Thani, Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Minister uh, of Qatar. We have uh, Pekka Haivistu, uh, the Foreign Minister of uh, Finland. Uh, we uh, have His uh, Highness uh, Prince Faisal uh, Al Saud, and we have uh, Senator Chris uh, Kuhn. So this should uh, be a perfect um, um, panel for discussing what I just outlined. So. Coming to you first, Kristalina, uh, even if you don't naturally, I am, have deal with geopolitics, it's become also a part of your agenda. And if you see the fragmentation of the global economy now, uh, is there a way to fix this? Uh, and how worried are you? Uh, let me uh, first uh, wish you all a very good 23. Uh, it is true in our economic uh, projections, uh, we expect growth to further decelerate this year. But since in the beginning of the year we do seek some good news, here it is for you. We also expect in 23 growth to bottom out. In other words, to start a process in which we go up rather than down. Uh, just to put in a context, uh, what going, going down means. Uh, 2021, we were quite optimistic. We discovered vaccines, COVID was retreating, and we finished the year with 6.1% uh, growth. Then we stepped into 22. January, Omicron reminded us that COVID may be down, but not gone. And on February 24th, Russia invaded Ukraine. Abrupt slowdown in the world economy. We are finishing, uh, we have finished last year with around 3.2% growth. Two times slower than in the previous year. Now in 23, we expect the growth to decelerate to around 2.7%. We would come with, new, with numbers uh, uh, soon. And what we see in the year are three very significant challenges. Number one, the war is still going on. And as long as the war goes uh, on, it has uh, a damning impact on confidence. Consumer confidence, business confidence, especially in the neighborhood, and I'm sure Pekka will talk about it. Number two, cost of living crisis, inflation that has been generated by multiple factors, but especially by the war, is hitting people, especially poor uh, households, very dramatically. And interest rates are at a level we have not seen them in decades. 
And that is the third uh, factor. High interest rates inevitably are going to contribute to a slowdown in the world uh, economy. So let's put the question of fragmentation in this context. And the context is, it's not great. So when it is not great, the logical thing would be for us to reach out to each other and see how we can do better together. But instead, what we are seeing is more forces that are pulling us apart. So we asked a very important question. What is the cost of fragmentation? And we came to Davos with an answer. If we manage the adjustment to more security of supplies smartly, and there is some decline in trade, the cost would be manageable, 0.2% of global output. Not nothing. It is still not great when growth is low and we are struggling. But if we manage this poorly, if we allow trade to collapse, the cost would be in the order of 7% of global GDP. Just think what 7% means. This is about $7 trillion lost. The equivalent of Germany and Japan taken together. And then further work says if we add to this technological fragmentation, the cost could be somewhere 8 to 12% of global GDP. Why I'm stressing this issue? today because we still have a choice to make and be wise and don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. An integrated global economy has served us all well. As a result of this integration, over the last 30 years, the world economy tripled for emerging markets and developing economies, it is even more important they quadrupled in size. But rich countries also benefited. Their economies doubled. And all this means 1.3 billion less extremely poor people on this planet. And it means higher standards of living for everyone. So my appeal is to be very rational. Yes. We will not go back to the days when costs were the only consideration for where you allocate production and how uh, supply chains work. COVID and the war told us security of supply requires some redundancy in supplies. In other words, there would be some cost. But if we are smart to keep that to the level where we make the economy, the world economy, more resilient and not in, drag the world into a place where we will be all poorer and we would be less secure. My fear is that we are sleepwalking into this world. But hey, here is Davos. Wake up! Do the right thing. <laughs> Thank you, this server. Applause for that. Uh, Chris Kunz, uh, Senator, um, we know the U.S. Is, is still the largest economy of the world. What you're hearing also, the managing director of IMF is saying here that uh, a bit of nearshoring uh, to avoid this notion of just um, in time and a little bit more just in case, building a little bit resilience is fine. But if we go too much into this notion of friendshoring or more protectionist measures, we can shave off a lot of growth globally. We know that there is, um, uh, there is a new House. Uh, there is also partly a new uh, Senate. Um, how far will the US go in friendshoring, making sure that things go to Mexico and countries that you're uh, allied uh, with. Uh, do you see the point of the um, IMF 
managing director and how will the U.S. balance this so we make sure that we also will have growth in the years to come and this will be a very shallow recession if a recession at all. Look, um, thank you. Thank you for your comments and the opportunity. I do think um, that American leaders and business leaders in particular recognize that the severe disruptions of the pandemic uh, and some of the challenges of uh, the reach and the scope of globalization um, that have caused a backlash in many of our countries, a populist uh, backlash, certainly in the United States, need to be addressed. One of the ways to deal with some of our challenges in terms of the hemisphere and migration also is to do some nearshoring to improve the job opportunities in Central America, for example. But I don't think it will be uh, as robust um, as um, potentially projected. I do think that we will continue um, to have an open economy, to be committed to free trade, and to see the robust value um, that globalization has brought to the world as well as to many of our people. Um, this is a delicate point. Uh, it is unclear where a divided Congress might go in trade policy. Um, but I do think there's been a lot of comment, a lot of concern uh, about the Inflation Reduction Act, one of the largest pieces of legislation that a divided Senate just passed, a 50-50 Senate, managed to do some robust things, invest in our own infrastructure, invest in our own science research, and invest in our own energy security and independence. Uh, I was encouraged to hear the comments uh, from Ursula von der Leyen earlier uh, today that we recognize that as we are implementing this significant investment, uh, we need to do it with an eye towards our closest partners and allies, um, and to do it not just for our benefit, but for the world's benefit. I think one thing that is missed in the coverage of the Inflation Reduction Act is that a lot of it is an investment in new clean energy technologies that can benefit the whole world. Uh, methane management and capture, carbon capture and sequestration, small modular reactors. Um, so if you take the message from the Inflation Reduction Act that somehow America has become solely protectionist and that we will abandon uh, multilateral finance or we will abandon the global markets that have uh, helped make so much progress uh, over the last decades, I, I don't think that is a correct reading. I think it was principally about our energy independence, not an attempt to harm others or to isolate us from others. And I do think um, that the implementation of it will end up proving to be um, more positive for the world as a whole than was initially seen. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Prince Faisal, um, uh, Saudi, uh, the kingdom, uh, is one of the largest energy producers uh, in the world. And in this discussion related to then cost of living, of course, um, oil price is also an incredibly uh, important part of it. So maybe you could comment on that. But also, um, the region that uh, Saudi Arabia uh, is situated is not the most peaceful uh, region uh, in the world. And uh, we know that uh, one of your neighboring countries, uh, Iran, um, the relationship there has been uh, complicated. Um, so maybe you could elaborate on both those two things. Sure, thanks. Uh, so on energy, uh, energy security is absolutely key. And here what we feel in the kingdom is that stability is absolutely the key to that energy security. So one of uh, uh, what we believe the successes of, for instance, OPEC and OPEC Plus has been, it has been able to deliver a relatively stable oil price, one that is uh, predictable by both consumers and producers. Some other energy sources have faced significant challenges in that regard, you know, significant rises. And uh, we continue to be committed to that. We are also, of course, committed to a clean energy future. But the only way we can transition uh, to a clean energy future in a way that doesn't impact the issues that Kristalina addressed, the issues of uh, access and, and ability for the developing world to continue their, uh, their path towards prosperity is if we can ensure some level of stability and predictability in the supply uh, of traditional sources of energy while we invest in renewable energy. So in Kingdom, for instance, is investing almost $200 billion in deploying renewable energies in the Kingdom and in, uh, abroad. Our companies are active in 21 countries around the world uh, deploying solar and wind energy and other sources of renewable energy. But that's going to take decades for the developing world especially to be able to have enough energy for it to replace uh, traditional energy fuels. In that interim period, we need to maintain a stable supply of traditional energies uh, and one that is priced in a way that ensures that stability. And that I think we have been able to do. This is certainly our feeling and we will continue uh, uh, to address that in a responsible uh, uh, way. Our neighborhood, you mentioned, and I want to 
really focus on the positive rather than on the negative, because our neighborhood is also showing signs that even in adverse uh, uh, circumstances, you can deliver success. The kingdom's economy, for instance, is going to be uh, this year the fastest growing economy in the world. Uh, through a very ambitious reform program, Vision 2030, we have been able to transition the economy in a significant way away from a dependence on hydrocarbons, on oil, as a source of revenue for the government and as a proportion of the GDP. That process continues to go on. Uh, we are activating uh, all kinds of uh, areas in the economy. Uh, unemployment is significantly down. Labor force participation is up, especially for women. So these are all signals that even in a difficult part of the world, you can be successful. And when it comes to Iran, you know, we have reached out. We are trying to find a path to dialogue with our neighbors in Iran because we believe very strongly that dialogue is the best pathway to resolving differences. And we feel quite strongly that what we are doing in the kingdom and what others in the region, especially the GCC countries, are doing in addressing the challenges of uh, their economy in uh, investing in their countries, in focusing on development rather than geopolitics, is a strong signal to Iran and others in the region that there is a pathway beyond uh, the traditional uh, arguments and the, dis the, the traditional disputes towards joint prosperity. And I think the more we can build a, a sense of cooperation in the region, the more we can work together, the more we can deliver not just prosperity for our people, but also for our immediate region and beyond. Thank you. Um, the relationship with your neighbor, I'm thinking about uh, the US here. Um, after the summer, there were some speculations that uh, there were um, some challenges in the relationship after the OPEC decision is 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 was that true or how, how would you how would you say it is um, today because we know that uh, Saudi Arabia and the U.S. traditionally has been very very close. So certainly a much less challenging relationship as a neighbor than the other neighbor we just talked about. But <laughs> yes. uh, but, but look, uh, certainly you know we have a strong partnership with the U.S. and we continue uh, uh, to work through that partnership. That doesn't mean we don't always. Uh, we, that we. That doesn't mean that we always agree. We sometimes disagree. We certainly disagreed uh, uh, on uh, the issue of the uh, uh, the oil market. In the end, we believe that I think our position was uh, uh, the correct one, and it showed through what we see now. The oil price continues to be stable. It's uh, uh, and, you know, and we have a responsibility uh, to the broader oil market, to the broader uh, uh, economies of the world, to make sure that we continue to provide that stability. But we're going to have a robust dialogue with our partners in the U.S. We're going to continue to work through any issues, but. Overall, uh, this relationship has delivered significant benefit, not just for our two countries, but for our region. And as we continue to address the issues that Kristalina just addressed and uh, that Senator Kuhns just addressed, the, we're going to need to work together. We are all going to need to work together. That means uh, uh, the GCC uh, with each other, the Kingdom with the, uh, the US, the US with Europe. Everybody's going to have to work with each other in order to address all of these challenges. If we start getting hung up on minor issues, uh, we are not going to be able to address the big challenges that face the world. And you share this view, Senator? Largely, yes. Uh, I, I will say one thing that has brought together uh, Republicans and Democrats in Congress, um, the American populace generally, and um, most of our core allies and partners in the world, um, is opposition to Russia's brutal aggression in Ukraine. Uh, and so I think there were initially some um, concerns expressed by many of us about the OPEC decision. And as time has gone on, I would agree with His Highness that as the price has stabilized and as we've had more dialogue, uh, we recognize there is a positive path forward for this long-standing, important relationship. Um, but many of us remain concerned about the path forward for Ukraine and ensuring um, that there is a commitment, a stability, and investment um, that gives um, Ukraine's leaders and those who are fighting bravely every day on the battlefield confidence that they will encourage that will encourage them uh, with the knowledge that there are many around the world who stand with them. We'll come back to uh, Ukraine. That's one of the other elephants in, in the room, I think. But I, I would like to go from the kingdom um, to Qatar, uh, to Sheikh Mohammed, Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Minister. The relationship also with Saudi Arabia is much better than it um, was a few years ago. I think we could uh, agree uh, on that. But it's still uh, a region with its uh, complications. Uh, Qatar um, is one of the largest exporters of natural gas. And I think Europe has been very um, 
pleased uh, with the, um, also the LNG uh, capacity. Where do you see natural, I have two questions, where do you see the role of natural gas being a bridge between the fossil um, fuel-based society and the renewable society, uh, Qatar's role there? And second, question is that we are talking about a lot of conflicts in the world. And Qatar also has played a role under your leadership as um, uh, important uh, in peace and reconciliation. But I think we're seeing that in many of the conflicts, it's very difficult because we can bring the horses to the well, but it's impossible to make them uh, drink the water. And, and I would love to, for example, hear your comment on the, on the latest development in Afghanistan that has uh, been a great concern for all of us. So, uh, Sheikh Mohammed. First of all, thank you, Borgi, for inviting me here. And I'm really pleased to be uh, among such a distinguished speakers and uh, uh, attendance here. Uh, regarding the first part of your question about the energy and, and the role of the LNG, we believe in, in Qatar as the gas is a safer, cleaner, and more reliable source of energy. And we believe that the gas will remain relevant and the destination fuel. And it is very important in the energy mix for the next decades to come. Now. When it comes to the transition agenda, uh, unfortunately, a lot of the policymakers, they have set uh, unattainable goals, like very aspirational goals, uh, that they didn't realize that this will need time, will need a significant amount of investment. And also, they uh, stopped or didn't allow uh, investments in, in, in the last 10 years, probably. And we have seen that this energy poverty, which unfortunately been accelerated because of, of the war uh, in Ukraine, uh, it is a result of, of, these, uh, of these policies. So I believe that uh, uh, this underinvestment, which Qatar didn't uh, follow, luckily, uh, allowed us now to have this additional capacity, which will come, become online in 2027, in order uh, to bring more gas uh, to the market, and especially to Europe uh, now, uh, since they are diversifying also uh, the, their source. We believe that uh, uh, the energy mix, uh, taking it in consideration, very important to keep the gas, to diversify also the sources, but also uh, to keep in consideration the other uh, sources of, of energy until they reach uh, these goals. I think also from uh, uh, another perspective, it's also unfair for a lot of developing countries to demand them not to develop their own resources and not to be energy independent while they are still in need uh, uh, for their development journey. And a lot of countries around the world, uh, actually, they are seeing the wealthier countries being uh, uh, unfair for them. Uh, in demanding them to stop uh, uh, to develop their own resources. Uh, the third point on, on this, uh, I'm not sure if there was an, an honest discussion about also this transition agenda and what kind of damage uh, uh, it might create for the earth uh, when you, we are talking about mining the rare earth or also mining the metals uh, to use them as uh, uh, as an input for, for all those uh, renewable energy equipment. So we believe that uh, it should be more a deeper conversation, more inclusive. All the countries need to be included in that conversation, not only the G7 or the developed uh, uh, countries to, uh, to set the agenda for, uh, for the world. Regarding uh, uh, our role in the conflict resolution, and as you mentioned, Borge, very correctly, that it's not, it's not an easy job. It's maybe, uh, it's, it is a difficult journey to bring par uh, parties with disagreements together to reach an agreement, but it's also more difficult to sustain the agreement. And we recognize the fact that uh, it's not easy for a country uh, like Afghanistan, which suffered not only in the last 20 years uh, of war, but really beyond that, uh, probably in the last 40 years, and they've been fighting with each other. Uh, we cannot expect that uh, an agreement that happened between them and the US will bring 
peace uh, uh, to the country in one day or one year. Uh, uh, especially there were no uh, uh, a real dialogue between uh, the parties of the war themselves. I mean, the Afghan, the inter-Afghan dialogue didn't uh, take place uh, properly. What happened recently and the recent measures by uh, the Taliban government in Afghanistan has been very disappointing for us. And we've been warning them from taking such a decisions that are going to just to make the situation much worse for the Afghan people, but also for the international community to be able to deal with them. Uh, does it mean that we are going to stop our efforts? No, we should continue. We always remain hopeful that uh, uh, the way we are engaging with others, we are engaging with people who are sometimes difficult to talk to, it's the only way forward to find a resolution. Otherwise, what would be the alternative? The alternative would be a civil war, a social unrest in the country, which is going to blow up for the entire region. So on, on the latter, I, I think uh, when we have a dialogue with uh, the players in Kabul is one thing, but uh, decision makers are also in Kandahar. Do, do you think there is a hope uh, in the near future to get the dialogue on this and, and change uh, the decisions? Or are we talking more medium, long term? Well, I've, uh, from the beginning, we've been uh, trying our best in order to reach out to them, either uh, uh, directly by us, but also by other countries in the region, and especially the Muslim countries, where we see them playing a major role in, uh, in such issues, especially the social and, and the economic uh, issues for, for Afghanistan. Uh, we've been trying even to reach out to Kandahar and to have a dialogue with them. Until now, we didn't succeed, but we are in a continuous con consultation with uh, other countries in the region, with uh, some Muslim countries, in order to go and to reach to reach out to them as, as a group of countries and to talk to them about these issues and about these measures that have been uh, uh, unfortunately uh, taken without any rationale. And uh, they couldn't even rationalize it for, for us, the ones who are talking to them. So uh, uh, I believe it's, it's not going to be an easy job, but it's very important to keep uh, trying and to keep insisting to uh, drive this change unless uh, until we see a real change happening there on the ground. No, thank you. It's about a uh, whole generation of girls and women's uh, rights to uh, education. So we hope uh, all that there will be a way of breaking that impasse. I said um, to Senator Kunz uh, that uh, we were going to come back to Europe. There is a war in Europe. Um, and uh, Pekka Haivestu, we, we've known each other for, for many years. Um, Pekka was uh, also a presidential candidate um, for the Greens. Uh, you became foreign minister in probably the most uh, demanding time for um, and, and challenging time for your country uh, in decades. Uh, had you ever reflected on that you, as, uh, as a Green, was, was the one that was going to um, bring uh, Finland into NATO? <laughs> well, well. Uh, actually, we had this kind of uh, very rapid NATO debate in Finland, which started 24th of February uh, last year and ended in uh, May when we tabled our uh, NATO documents. And of course, we were so happy to get Sweden on board. I have to say that I was more skeptical with the Swedish possibilities after two years of 200 years of neutrality to, to join. It was, it was a was bigger, changing religion, huh? Yeah, it's a, it was a bigger issue there as you as a Nordic Nordic background, you, you know about it. But but I have to say that my party uh, fully ag agreed with that. But uh, even the left wing alliance that has had in their program the anti NATO uh, policy changed their policies and, and, and voted in favor. So it was a very unified Finland. But maybe on, on the Ukraine issue and on the security situation, I have to say that the black swans, unfortunately, are now coming from Europe yeah. and the risks are coming from Europe. Of course, we can think about this different kind of escalation of the conflict, mm -hmm. uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine. We, of course, would like to support the Zelensky's 10-point peace plan, but, but peace, it needs two to tango. Mm -hmm. we, we know that. And then I think the, the issue, I, I, I'm 
when we speak about the multilateralism and how the international organization work in this time, of course, Helsinki was the place where the Helsinki Final Act 1975 was signed. It was some kind of end of the Cold War. And now Finland will be sharing the OSC 2025 50th celebration. And, and I don't know if it's a real celebration because we see a broken structure in European security. And what I would like actually to defend a little bit the UN because I'm facing a lot of questions that should we close the whole shop with the UN at the moment because UN cannot defend Ukraine and UN can do this and that. I have been saying that actually according to the UN Charter, Article 51, a country which is attacked can ask help from the other countries until the problems are solved in the UN Security Council. And we are exactly there. Ukraine has been attacked. Ukraine asked for help from other countries. We are helping. We are waiting for the Security Council to solve issue. And of course, the bottleneck is the Security Council. And now, instead of the Security Council, we have the General Assembly that has been taking a very high moral high stand on, on this issue. And, and that's important. We have an international uh, agreement on, on that issue. But of course, at the same time, we should work through the UN on, on issues where we can. The food security is one. The grain trade channel that has been opened, I think it's a success story. I just two days ago discussed with uh, Mr. Grossi from the IAEA, who was on his way to Ukraine to look at the nuclear safety issue, very important for Europe and globally, and even some uh, exchange of prisoners that is ongoing. I think the Turks are, are negotiating successfully in Ankara on, on this issue. It shows that uh, these channels are open and discussion, are op discussion channels are open. Mm -hmm. But of course, it's very important that we stay in solidarity with Ukraine, defend their independence, their, their borders. And I'm also quite proud citizen of European Union, I have to say, because we, in the beginning, everybody was very skeptical how European Union will react, are we united and so forth. We have through the European Peace Facility been supporting militarily uh, Ukraine systematically and together with the US and, and UK, an excellent cooperation on, on support of the Ukraine. But of course, the big challenge remains, how do we get Russia out of Ukraine, how do we get peace? that is permanent peace in the region and what, even what kind of security guarantees we can organize for Ukraine. And, and, and Finland has 1,300 kilometers border with Russia. So um, uh, what I follow in, in Finnish politics is also this notion that uh, Ukraine is then uh, really also about uh, other neighbors' uh, future with Russia. Is that your interpretation too? Well, of course, we Finns, we are very security-oriented people. And when we look at the world news, we always ask first, what if this is happening on our borders? <laughs> and only, only then, when we have solved that question, then we say how to organize the solidarity towards those who are in, in trouble. And I, I, I think it's from our history. And when, uh, when first uh, Belarus organized uh, illegal migration over the border to Poland, the Finns asked, what if this is happening on our border? Mm -hmm. When Ukraine was attacked by Russia, we asked ourselves, what if this is happening to our border? And that led us to NATO debate, particularly actually these unconventional mm -hmm. weapons issues, like the nuclear threat, the chemical weapons threat. People asked that, hey, we have a quite strong traditional military, traditional army, big reserves, but what if we are threatened with the unconventional weapons? And I think it's fair enough to ask, unfortunately, today also that kind of questions when we see the uh, prognosis of the war. war. And uh, I think that's where we, where we are. We are all the time saying that we are bringing a peaceful border to NATO, 1,300 kilometer peaceful border. Our border authorities are still working. We have limited visas towards Russian citizens, but we allow those who are working to come over, those who have, uh, are studying in Finland, and those who have relatives or those who need a hospital treatment. So we are, there, is, uh, uh, there is traffic over the border. I, I think um, the question we are all asking us is um, when and how can this uh, war end? And I, as foreign minister, I used to also come always come to Helsinki and, and discuss with you and your predecessor and the president about Russia, because uh, there is a lot of knowledge about Russia uh, in Finland. It is a long uh, history. I, I guess that there, um, the mood is not the best in Kremlin these days, because I think the plan was probably to take uh, um, Kiev uh, in a week. That didn't happen. Uh, the war is not going. Um, as it was planned, uh, Europe uh, is united. But a war needs also to end. So what, what, 
what is now the current thinking in uh, Kremlin? A, do they see a way out of this? Uh, do they think about that at all? Or is the mentality now that we just double down on it, we just, we, we, we just have to continue even attacking uh, civilians and, and breaking um, basic humanitarian law? Well, I maybe wouldn't sit here if I had the right information directly from Kremlin, but uh, I, I would use it. Use I said it. understanding of the uh, mentality. I would use it immediately, but, uh, but let, let, me, let me say how we Finns look at the situation. We have been living, we have a long neighborhood with Russia. We have even been part of the Russia during our autonomy time and so forth. But let's look 100 years first backwards. We had a... a, a, a uh, not, not king, but the Tsar, and then came Lenin, and then came Stalin, and of course, then came Rutschev, and, and then uh, Brezhnev, and then Gorbachev, and, and uh, Yeltsin, and then Putin. And we see this zigzag 100 years in the history. And when we look towards the future, our best guess is that this will be the similar zigzag 100 years from now. But in all these circumstances, we have to live in the neighborhood with this country, and we have to understand somehow exactly the mentality. Currently, we see a race in patriotism. We see quite weak opposition in Russia. Many people have left Russia who think in a different way and so forth. Many young people and Russia, there's a huge brain drain from Russia at the moment. And this is, of course, not good for the Russian future, if we, if we think in that way. But at the moment, we, we don't see any movement that is from the inside Russia stopping the war and, and so forth. So we, we, we can only think that militarily, Russia should be stopped. And militarily, it should be shown that there is a limit. You cannot go, there is a red limit. You cannot go over the border of a country without any consequences. And I think, by the way, when I'm referring to this UN uh, Article 51, I have been, when people ask, has it been used before? I said, 1990, autumn, I was sitting in the Finnish parliament, a delegation from Kuwait came and said, Iraq has been occupying our country, can you help? And a coalition of voluntary countries were formed. So actually, 1990, it was the same mechanism. And, and that's, that gives us the responsibility to protect Ukraine as, as much as we can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think I'm, of course, uh, trying to be a, a neutral uh, moderator here. But I, I think there is, uh, wasn't there a Budapest memorandum in 94? And, and there was no dispute about the borders this, uh, originally. It was an acknowledgement of the borders, wasn't it? Yes, yes, all, all borders, of course, have been recognized. And, and, and already what happened in 2014, of course, the stealing of the Crimea by Russia, everybody said that we should have been reading these marks even more clearly. We can be critical to ourselves that we didn't maybe react strongly enough, but of course, major violation of the international rules has happened. And major, viol major violence against the rules of the human rights have happened, of course, in this bombing of the civilian locations and others. And I think it's very important, wherever the countries are coming from, that in the UN to, to agree on those principles. And there are some principles, and we have to respect those. And you're sending weapons to Ukraine too, Finland? We are sending weapons, and we have been sending 11 hard packages. The latest one was worth of 55 million. Uh, euros and, and we are discussing now about the Leopard 2 tanks. We have some of them in Finland bought very cheaply from Netherlands, by the way, <laughs> in the time of the peace. And, uh, uh, and, uh, but this is an issue, this Leopard 2 tanks that is pending on Germany yeah. and Germany and Poland. But basically these are German-made tanks, so Germ we need a permission from Germany, but also we need a bigger slot of same models to be sent, otherwise it's quite useless. So, um, coming back to you, Senator Kunz, because um, I um, heard uh, today that, um, of course, the support uh, from uh, the US there has been critical uh, for uh, Ukraine. You had also President uh, Zelensky addressing both the chambers uh, of uh, the Congress. But uh, there is also this discussion going on, though, uh, how long uh, the U.S. Uh, will uh, support the war. And one of the things that is said uh, also from Kremlin is that, you know, we don't know how long this will continue because there is also not full alignment on this uh, thing uh, in uh, the U.S. Uh, you think with... Um, uh, Republican uh, majority now in the House and, and the, the Democratic majority in the Senate. Do you, do you 
Do you think there, there, there will be changes in the U.S. policy here, or, or is there just uh, a few uh, single voices? I think there are just a few single voices. I think there are folks in the left and the right in our political spectrum who are questioning the cost, uh, but I think this is something uh, where uh, the overwhelming majority of the members of Congress uh, and of our people um, support a continued robust partnership with all of our allies in Europe and around the world, frankly, um, to see this as what it is, uh, a brutal war of aggression, uh, an attempt to rewrite um, the boundaries of Europe, uh, an imperial war. Uh, and frankly, um, after tens of thousands of Ukrainians have died fighting, um, we cannot step back at this point. Putin had calculated that he could divide um, the West during the winter uh, by having huge costs, cutting off energy uh, and making uh, Europe bear some of the costs. That has not happened. He calculated that by striking a civilian infrastructure and leaving millions of Ukrainians in the cold and the dark, he could break their will. That has not happened. Uh, now Putin has to assess uh, where the costs are greater, where the risks are greater. And I think Western unity and unity in pushing back against this aggression um, is critical. Um, it will determine a lot of the shape of the next few decades. He has already made a huge strategic mistake. Uh, Finland and Sweden will join NATO, uh, doubling the border with Russia and bringing two sophisticated advanced economies into NATO. Um, I think what we now need to see is a path towards a successful conclusion and the liberation of Ukraine. Thank you. Of course, if there's any of the GCC foreign ministers that want to comment here, please feel free to come in on this topic. If not, I will uh, go to Kristalina. Yeah, I mean, just to say, and I'll just say that, uh, you know, we've heard and you emphasize this, that uh, this conflict has impacts well beyond just uh, Ukraine. And uh, at some point, we need to find a pathway to ending the conflict. So that's, I think, if you listen to the developing world, that's the message you will hear mostly, is you know, that this is significant. And of course, obviously, uh, uh, this is a complex question. But we will have to talk about how we find uh, a pathway to ending the conflict. And Paka kind of mentioned that there are already some uh, efforts uh, on the margins, let's say, uh, you know, uh, prisoner transfers, you know, we, we were involved in some of those, uh, Turkey's doing some of those. Uh, uh, there's work on nuclear uh, safety, which might be a, a doorway. So they need, you know, we need to also look towards a path to ending this conflict, because without that, the uncertainty that Kristalina referred to is going to continue. Thank you. Sheikh Mama? Well, um, uh, I think, look, uh, Borge, what just Pekka mentioned about, uh, you know, referring to the Charter of United Nations and uh, like, no one from us, no one, at least, you know, Qatar, GCC, all, all of the countries, we voted, for example, for the resolution. Mm -hmm. No one would like to see an aggression toward another country or threatening of using of power. And we want to see everyone standing up uh, and abiding by the UN Charter. But what really, uh, you know, uh, struck us in the region when we are looking at the world, you know, mobilizing only for specific cases and specific causes, and we've been in the Middle East like suffering for decades from uh, all violations uh, uh, for UN Charter, including from the Palestinian-Israeli issue to the Syrian issue, and just, you know, uh, a lot of other things uh, going on. We would like to see the same world stand for these uh, uh, kinds of causes because, unfortunately, we still see them unaddressed and, and just continuing. There is a, a, a very big concern now among the region with what's happening uh, uh, in Palestine with all these uh, provocative policies. We would like to see a, a real stand from our allies and partners also to stop the Israeli government from taking such an actions. And this is applied also to the suffering of the Syrian people and others. We would really want to see an end for this war uh, in Ukraine. We would like to see everyone uh, uh, abiding with the Charter of United Nations. We want to see an end of the suffering of the Ukrainian people as soon as possible, as well as the other people in, in the world. Thank you. Uh, it says time out, but, um, but Kristalina, 
I think we can at least uh, recover, take uh, the privilege of uh, prerogative of taking uh, two minutes. I think you're the only one Russian speaking on this <laughs> panel too, and uh, we should not forget that Kristalina grew up in, in Bulgaria. You also was the World Bank's representative. I remember I met you in, in Moscow. So how, how do you look at this? Will there, is there an end to it? And I think the economic impact and also on food prices and et cetera is, is, is quite terrible. So if you can, do that in two, three minutes. Well, it is tragic to see um, Russia taking uh, uh, such a course uh, to destabilize um, Ukraine, but also destabilize itself. And uh, if you look at 22, the biggest, uh, single biggest factor affecting the world economy was this uh, senseless war. What I know about uh, Russia is that um, uh, one of the um, uh, pitfalls of the last decades was um, the fact that there wasn't more concerted effort to integrate the Russian society, the Russian people, within the world community. Uh, when I was in the European Commission, I used to very often say, Pekka, we have to have more people-to-people -people exchanges with Russia so we have the Russian people feeling that they are part of a uh, family of nations rather than being um, taught that they are somehow different. I was country director for Russia based in Moscow in the best days uh, when uh, Russia was reforming and there was G8, remember these days? <laughs> and at that time, when you ask the Russian people who they are, how they define themselves, the majority would say Europeans. Even the Russians that live in the Asian part of Russia. When you ask the Russian people today, they say we are different. We are a different civilization. We are different from, uh, from the rest of the world. So if I draw one lesson, is to remember that, yes, policies are defined in the high corridors of power. But when a population of a country subscribes to policies that are detrimental to their own interests, there is something for the world to reflect on and perhaps think about ways in which we can do more people-to-people -people exchange. I am concerned uh, that in, in this uh, horrible thing Russia has done, there is a bit of kind of vilifying all Russians. We throw them all in that pot. And we have to be careful about it. There are so many uh, wonderful, smart uh, Russian people that don't agree with these policies. Uh, some of them are now in Poland and you know, in, in, uh, in Finland. Uh, uh, and, and try to think not in this, to take this individual case of Russia and say a world that is more integrated is a world where we are connected on the basis of our humanity and we recognize how much we depend on each other. That we actually, all of us, we are not that different. We are all part of uh, humanity. And uh, to finish on, on this note on, on Russia, those who speak, are there sp Russian speakers in the audience? Anybody? I think there's. It's like me, <laughs> okay? No, no, there is a couple. There's some. Yeah. There is a very famous Russian song, and when the war started, it spiked into my, my mind, uh, that is about Russia not wanting the Second World War. And the song is Khatyatli Ruskie Vainai. Do the Russians want a war? And the whole notion of the, of the song is not they don't. What happened? Why did it happen? and how we can put an end uh, to it. Uh, I want to leave us with this uh, uh, notion that, that even the Hundred Years' War ended where? At the negotiating table. The sooner we define a space, as everybody here said, for this horrible war to end, the better for everyone. And of course, great news for the world economy. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, first, I'm, I'm, 
I'm biased as the moderator, but I uh, thought we had a very interesting uh, discussion, a very insightful panel. This is like, for me, uh, the best kind of dialogues in, in Davos, as I remember the dialogues two decades ago also in Davos. Um, small room uh, with uh, the most insightful uh, people uh, in the world. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Big